All right, Ed, first of all, just big question off the top. Why are you running for governor? The governor really has an immense ability to bring positive change to the state quickly because the governor has oversight over the state's budget. And if you change the way that you fund government, you will change the government itself. And I'm a finance guy, I think it's really powerful because if you want the truth in politics, you have to follow the money. And I know exactly what's going on in the state government. I think it's time for some change. More on that though, why are you the right person for the job? Because I don't just take the data that's given to me by the corporate lobbyists and by the directors of the various agencies. I, my biggest critique of a lot of the career politicians we have now, they believe everything they're told is the gospel truth. And the people presenting that kind of information have a political agenda. I am somebody who asks a lot more questions to get to the root of problems. And I take a deep dive and figure out, and this is why I say follow the money, because it tells you exactly what is going on and where we're investing our resources. For this part of it, you can only name one, but what is your top priority and why? School choice, no doubt. Uh, families should have more educational options, and wherever the families want to enroll their children, uh, I think the tax star should follow their kids to the school of their choice. This is really a powerful issue for everybody here in the, in the state of Idaho. Not only will it alleviate some of the divisiveness and the contention that we're experiencing in our communities across the state, but it'll allow families to take control over their children's future and ensure that they have an education that meets their needs. So do you support using public tax money for vouchers for parents to send their kids to private schools? Absolutely, yeah, I believe public or private, uh, that families should choose how their kids get educated. I don't believe in an institutionalized, one-size-fits-all model. And the way I understand it, though, that's not constitutional, the way the Idaho Constitution is written. Well, we'll have to let the attorneys hammer that one out, but the reality is that we need to implement those kind of changes in education. Families across the state are demanding it. So if, it, if, it needs, if the Constitution needs to be amended, well, then let's get the process started. Over the last few years, the legislature and the governors have pumped quite a bit more money into the education budget. Mm -hmm. Would you support that if you win to keep increasing funding for teacher pay and technology, things like that? Teachers would make a lot more money under a school choice model than they ever have under this broken model we have right now because the funding is going to follow the schools and Schools that choose to compensate their teachers and teachers could be re uh, rewarded for the, an entrepreneurial spirit by starting their own schools. Uh, it'll allow them to really take control of their pay. So yeah, I do believe we need to make significant investments in the rising generation. It's important, but we need to invest it in the right way. Do you believe that critical race theory is being taught in Idaho's public schools and, and why or why not? I don't believe it, I know it. It's an absolute fact, and it's really a shame that this isn't something that gets more coverage. I'll share with you uh, some recent examples, but uh, uh, Boise State University, they have a racial inventory quiz, and it asks the question, what event led to the rise of the idea of white supremacy? And, and according to them, they say it's the Declaration of Independence. That's a betrayal. That is not, that is not ethical or moral to, to teach an entire generation to hate this nation, but particularly K-12 level. I've seen with my own eyes uh, uh, posters that s high school students created uh, over in, in Bonneville County even uh, saying things like, uh, white people are genetically defective descendants of albino mutants. This is hateful. It's evil. It doesn't belong in our schools. The state recently passed one of the most restrictive abortion bans in the country, banning abortions after six weeks of pregnancy and allowing family members to sue doctors who perform abortion. Um, it's being challenged, of course. Do you believe that was the right bill for this time? Absolutely. This, this entire country, we're missing over 60 million Americans today since Roe v. Wade, and it's a real travesty. And I have to, I mean, what are we missing from science and culture and the arts? Because 60 million people never got their chance. We need to embrace our, uh, the rising generation, our future potential, not, and not terminate them before they ever get their opportunity. Do you support any exemptions? 
I don't believe abortion is an appropriate measure at all. The reality is I understand that there are a number of members of the legislature and the like who want to ensure that there's exemptions for rape or incest specifically. In my own life, one of the people that had one of the most profound impacts on my life was actually a product of incest. And so these are tragic scenarios, but those people too, they, they have an incredible potential and something to offer this, this world. I would, I personally like to see abortion abolished entirely. Uh, I understand that that's going to take time to get people to start to realize how we're really uh, undercutting our own potential, our own growth as a nation. Uh, but every step in that uh, direction to restrict it is something that I, would, I celebrate. The legislature and the governor just approved the largest tax cut, um, tax relief package in the state's history. Um, do you think more tax cuts should be enacted next year, and what is your tax plan? Well, and this is where it becomes a, a, a giant shell game. I, again, any step in, in that direction, I, 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 again, I celebrate that. Uh, but when you're getting massive injections of money from the federal government, uh, we are, that, that money all comes, it doesn't come with strings attached, it comes with chains attached. And you have bureaucrats in Washington, D.C., they don't know what bathroom to use. They want to tell us how we need to educate kids in Idaho. Uh, I think that a lot of that money, some of it we're rightfully owed, uh, payment in lieu of taxes, for instance. Uh, but much of it is very problematic. I think it was a step in the right direction to reduce it. If I were elected governor, I would abolish the personal income tax in Just the completely state. abolish it. Absolutely. How do you replace it? Well, the first thing we need to stop doing is cutting $50 million tax deals with multinational corporations like Facebook, like our, our governor just did. Th that is completely out of control. These multinational corporations, they don't have Idaho's interests at heart. They can pay taxes, but uh, the working class members, our retired citizens, the small and medium sized business owners of this state, they ought to be rewarded for the fruits of their labors. You mentioned on your website that you would replace the income tax with surplus and also cash investments. And I forget what the third one was, but is that enough to replace the roughly 6%? I'm sorry, uh, to replace the income tax as it stands? The income tax brings in about $2 billion a year in revenues to the state government. What a lot of people don't realize, and so often we hear politicians, they talk about the general fund, but there are over 360 funds in the state government. They're sitting well on over $8 billion in cash and short-term investments. This is not including the pension. Nobody's going after Percy. We need to protect that for the people who earned it. Uh, but I'm all for a rainy day fund. That's what I, I wouldn't be doing my job as a financial advisor if I didn't advocate for rainy day funds. We need to have that intact here. But the rainy day fund is about 400 and something million. Eight billion dollars, this is, this is out of control. We are severely overtaxed. And we have a government that has over 200 governmental bodies now. 100, over 180 agencies, 20 departments. It's out of control growth. And in three years, this governor has grown the state government when you measure by expenditures by 32%. It's completely inappropriate. But then you can take away the tax cuts on that side of it and the fact that it's being given back to the people. Do you consider that an expenditure? We're getting money from the federal government right now. So no, that's not an expenditure. An expenditure is uh, providing salaries, resources, welfare payments, things like that. So I guess my question was, does that, doesn't that kind of balance out the expenditures? Not when you're getting tons of money from the federal government that subjugate Idaho agencies to federal bureaucracies. Look, anybody can, can offer tax cuts and balance a budget when they're getting massive billions, a uh, billion dollar infusions from uh, the federal government. This is not a fiscally feasible plan. This is, it's out of control. In general, what do you see as the biggest challenge facing Idaho in 2022 and going into 2023 when the new governor or the current governor will continue on? Right now, we have a major issue with housing prices across the state. Again, there, uh, our education system has developed a complete obsession with getting all the young people in the state, getting into a, a college uh, uh, program and then working in an office. But people need to build roads and build homes. And if somebody enjoys turning a wrench, 
That's fantastic. They're creating immense value for their communities. I'll tell you the whole unemployment rate conversation is a complete, it's all political theater. There's all sorts of exemptions and six different tiers. If you wanna know a real statistic, look at labor force participation rate. And this is how we're gonna fix the housing price crisis. 10 years ago, we had a 72% labor force participation, which essentially saying who, who's 16 years and older, what proportion of them are gainfully employed or self-employed today, it's down to 62%. And part of the reason we're taking these kids out of the labor force, takes five to six years now to get a bachelor's degree. They're saddled with all sorts of debt. I would uh, offer more vocational training. Let's get more people out there building homes and increasing the supply of those homes will make sure with uh, increased availability that prices stabilize so that uh, uh, family members can, uh, can stay in this state, but People can live in the communities where they work. Uh, we have to make serious changes to the labor force pipeline right now. It's way out of whack. Why aren't there enough employees right now? I mean, so, we see so many businesses that have to close down or you know, for a couple of days a week or they make adjustments yeah. because and we're talking across the board. I mean, mm -hmm. agriculture, we're talking you know, stores and restaurants. Mm -hmm. They're all struggling to, to find enough employees. Why? Well, we're missing a tenth of our labor force, as I just said. That's a big part of the reason. The other part, you have to look, we have a labor force, about 750,000 members of our labor force right now, but there's 125,000 Idahoans on welfare in this state. That's outrageous. There are more jobs than people to fill them. And look, you're talking to somebody, I grew up as a little boy, I ate food bank food. I grew up on the other side of the tracks. These welfare programs in their current state are out of control and there's so much waste and abuse in them. Let me ask you this question and then I have one more. So what will you do about, when I say managing rapid growth, I don't mean curtailing it, but I mean, how do you approach managing the rapid growth, especially that the Valley is seeing? Well, I believe growth should pay for itself. Right now, the reason nobody knows what their next property tax bill is gonna be is because they're figuring out what to bill everyone for the new infrastructure and new services that are, are to be provided. My tax plan, I'm advocating that we cap property taxes. So when you go to buy a home, you know what the total annual property tax bill will be on that home for your entire lifetime. And uh, certainly there, there will need to be minor, small adjustments for inflation along the way. But what that will do, that will force municipalities across the state of Idaho to ensure that growth pays for itself. And there are other funding uh, mechanisms to ensure that they get uh, the money they need to continue to grow, but it's not right to be saddling, especially for our, our senior citizens on a fixed income that are getting priced out of their homes now because of uh, skyrocketing, unpredictable property taxes. Uh, we're going we're gonna to fix it and make growth pay for itself. Finally, Ed, what is the biggest opportunity you see that Idaho has? I think right now we have to lead out in a very bold way and start to reveal to America what has been going on. We have been taken advantage of by these multinational giant corporations and we have far too many politicians that are bought and paid for by those kind of organizations and they're hurting our state and they're advocating for policies that aren't right for Idaho. But uh, in particular, I'll, I'll, I'll name the healthcare systems in this state. Are, are completely out of control. And the Idaho Code grants the governor the ability to require an investigation into any corporation in the state of Idaho. If I were elected governor, I would investigate the three largest healthcare systems in this state. I, want, I have one question. We gave them hundreds of millions of federal and state tax dollars. What, what did they do with all our money? Because they didn't expand their treatment capacity. This is something that needs to be investigated. The members of this community, people who lost friends and families, deserve to know and answer what they did with hundreds of millions of our tax dollars. Wasn't that for the types of things like personal protection equipment, ventilators, and things that were COVID specific? Doug, I will tell you, somebody leaked one of these healthcare systems financials to me and I had a chance to review it myself. That's a cute story but that's nothing more than a, than a story. No, there's a lot more to this. I hope to see some serious investigations into it. And by the way, the last Form 990 that came out of St. Luke's, their CEO's now making over $10 million a year. 
I'm sick of that kind of stuff. We are done with these games where they cash in on our tax dollars and they hire corporate lobbyists that enact the policies that benefit their organizations. I'm coming after them and we're gonna to get to the bottom of the truth. Look, my, my wife's a healthcare worker. My, my recently deceased mother was a, was a nurse. Uh, you know, people can try to attack me and make it about the healthcare workers. It's not, it's about the executives and it's time to give them a run for their money. Ed, thank you. Thank you.